I think she does a terrific job for the athletic, and the best is yet to come. And she joins us here on the Bernie Miklas Show. Katie Wu from the Athletic. How are you doing? Hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, all things considered, on this lovely day uh, for our beloved Major League Baseball. Um, but, you know, happy to be talking and, and talking to you and just providing any kind of, of insight or distraction to what's going on with MLB today. Well, can I get your opinion on that? Um, I, I'm like, it, it shows you how naive I am despite all these years in the business. I, I really never thought it would get to this point. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm shocked now, but uh, I, I, I passed that stage a while back that I realized it was going to get to this point. But, I, Katie, I, I just can't see a motivation um, other than uh, ownership's just determined to score a total victory. It just seems kind of like a – unmerciful way to go about this but i can't come to any conclusion unless it changes i agree it's so demoralizing just to see the the essential gatekeepers of this sport not really care that they're playing a direct hand into the decline of the sport and i i'm with you i thought you know maybe i was a little naive because i didn't think it was going to get to this point when the lockout first started when mlb first instituted that lockout in early december i really thought that by the first week of scheduled spring training, there'd be some semblance of a deal, some sort of optimism. And as we went on through the winter, I realized that I was just also being incredibly naive. And we were so far from that. Um, It's very disheartening to see where MLB is today. And I I commend the Players Association for taking a stand and fighting for what they think is right. Um, It's been pretty clear throughout these negotiations. And, you know, I want to make it very clear. I'm no labor expert. I'm not in Jupiter, Florida. This is just what I've been reading and following along from from talking to people in the industry. But it's been very clear that these have been very one-sided negotiations, and MLB and the owners seem adamant in squeezing out every possible potential of power that they possibly can. And unfortunately, the people that suffer the most are the fans. And and, and the other reason why I don't get this, uh, even though I accept it, it is the reality on the ground, but I don't get it, is that how can a group of people be so tone deaf? And, and I know they've got all kinds of TV money coming in under the previous contract, another one kicking in um, this year. And so they, they have that insurance, I guess you would say, knowing that the TV revenue is going to be there. But th- that do- that's only a part of what will make baseball successful and not to make a speech. But we all know they have a problem uh, a big problem uh, cultivating young fans and more more diversified f- fans and just uh, just fixing the game to make it more appealing to every generation and they've done nothing on that front and it's, it's just like I don't know why they think they can do this this scorched earth uh, attitude against the players and not see the landscape that will be uh, will be there waiting for them. And that landscape's going to be pretty damaged. And it's not going to address some of the really fundamentally important uh, aspects of long-term, the long-term baseball picture. It's just, I don't know how you could be so tone deaf. I agree. And I think they're really underestimating the power of social media. I mean, we both know social media has its perks and its drawbacks, right? But I think what you're seeing now is, the players have their own voice. I mean, they've always had it, but this is the first time in any of the kind of the history of the labor negotiations of this sport that players so easily have their own platform to speak their mind and, and call something out if something is, is not factual, if there is something that's being spun, that they're like, hey, that's not what we're hearing. You know, the players are very much controlling of this narrative as well. And I don't think MLB or the owners have really – paid that into any kind of consideration. Um, it, it's just a mess all around, and it's frustrating, it's disheartening, it's discouraging. I mean, it is a beautiful day in St. Louis, I will say that, but I'm sure it's even more gorgeous than Jupiter. And at 4 o'clock on a Monday, we should be talking about those early Grapefruit League games, right? Like, we, that's where we should be as a sport. And the, how this whole negotiation and ho- everything has unfolded, especially over the last week, has made me realize, and I know it's made a ton of fans realize, that we are so far from that. We are so far from just playing baseball. And it really just is incredibly disappointing. Yeah, I, I just happened to go over to MLB.com. Um, I can't even remember why. Well, maybe just to see if there was much there. But uh, one of the first things that jumped out at me, th- I think this was late last night or early this morning, 
was, you know, they still had um, like spring training schedules on there. You know, they would put canceled by the game. But like to your to your observation just now, you know, the Cardinals, I believe, if I was reading this correctly today, were to play like a, have a, sp- a split split squad day, you know, playing the Mets in one game and maybe the Nationals, maybe the Nationals in another and yeah, I, I, as I'm on the air right now, I should be reading tweets from you and Derek Gould and Rob Rains and others, you know, like about telling me how this guy pitched or how this guy unfortunately had a little discomfort in his forearm or uh, this kid's looking, you know, this rookie is looking great. You know, th- that that's what we should be doing now. It's really a shame. Uh, it's really a shame. It is. It is. It is. And I, I would love to get back doing that. You know, it's ironic. I'm starting my second year on the Cardinals beat that I've never actually even made it to their spring facility. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, am I ever going to see Jupiter, Florida? Is that even a real place? <laughs> uh, it's surreal and not necessarily in a good way. Katie Wu with us from the Athletics covering the Cardinals for her second year on the beat. And I wanted to ask you um, this about – spring training and the broken routine and then there will be a rush to get ready whenever uh, the owners call off the dogs and who knows when that'll be um this is true of every team but i i want to localize it i i I don't i I think this can impact the cardinals or this will impact the cardinals in a way that's not so hot you know considering um you know having a rush to get pitchers ready and they have a pretty fragile rotation as it is and and i'm not i'm not going to like list everything because then I'd be doing what I normally do, which is really irritating. I answer my own question, so I'll shut up. But <laughs> in, in, what, in what way do you think uh, the Cardinals could be adversely affected by uh, a very short spring training then, that will then become a very let's rush and go through it spring training? No, absolutely, and, and that's a fantastic point. That You're right, it is going to affect all 30 teams to some extent. This is certainly not a Cardinal-specific problem. But something that I really want to identify, and you touched on it there, is is the, the Cardinal starting rotation. You have three guys coming back from pretty significant injuries, and Jack Flaherty, uh, Dakota Hudson, and Miles Michaelis, right? You don't want to have a shortened spring where everything is rushed. And, of course, these guys are, are – keeping their off-season training regimes intact. You know, they're still in shape. It's not like they've been slacking off like, you know, maybe I have over the, the lockout. They, they prefer, for their case, have been putting in plenty of work. But when you look at the overall body of the starting rotation, which already has many questions, which is already considered a little thin based on the injury history of last year, you think, well, it can't really go well. You don't have a lot of optimism if you're going to throw together a short spring and then go right into games, into a full season. And, and the fact of the matter is, Whenever this lockout is, is called off, it's not like everyone is going to sense it coming, right? Like, this is going to be a very much drop what you're doing, okay, it's go time. And you have to wonder from the Cardinals' perspective how that's going to affect your starting pitching when that seems to be, in a normal season, their biggest question mark throughout their roster. And and I would think that it, um, it, it, it wouldn't be so hot in terms of uh... – allocating jobs or assignments like with an Alex Reyes or Jordan Hicks I mean how could they possibly be conditioned for uh, a starter job under these circumstances I mean it would really be a push that's another thing and I wanted to ask you this though how would it how do you think it affects uh, a Nolan Gorman or a uh, Juan Yepes just just to isolate on those two maybe even a Brendan Donovan in terms of their ability to make an impression and and possibly stick at the beginning of the season or if not that you know be on the wait list to be called up really soon. Yeah, it's unfortunate for these prospects as well, because when you think about it, a good majority of them were affected with either no season in 2020 or a alternate site in 2020. They go to 2021, they get almost a full season in there, and then all of a sudden in 2022, there's a bunch of question marks. I know guys on the 40-man are certainly going to be impacted. That includes Donovan and Yepes when the minor league season starts, because they are on the 40-man roster. Nolan Gorman's always been his, – his window has always been 2022 around the summertime to make his big league debut. But whether that remains to be his actual window whenever baseball starts off, we don't know because so many things are so fluid. All these things are impacted each day. And, again, this is not a Cardinals-centric problem. This is going to be a problem that you see throughout the sport. There is no way to really evaluate your minor leaguers unless they are some of the minor leaguers that are – able to play the top prospects that are able to play in minor league baseball and it's it's just kind of a 
wait and see situation all around. I mean, you look at guys like Johan Oviedo, he's also going to be affected by that. Uh, Brennan Donovan, as you mentioned, these are all guys that are, are primed to make some sort of an impact next year, but their chances in doing so, in my opinion, get smaller the, the less of a, of a chance we have at a full season. And right now that chance looks pretty slim. And another consideration, I want your opinion on it, and it, 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 as far as we can guess or estimate, I guess is the way to put it, you have a rookie manager, and yeah, he's been on the major league staff, and yeah, he's helped run spring training in the past for Mike Schilt, and he's a very smart guy, but he is a rookie manager in uh, Ali Marmal, and you've had some conversations with him, and, and I, th- I think you'll, you're going to do an excellent job covering the Cardinals in part, but I th- I, my sense is that you and you know, uh, Ali likes to communicate, and I think you've sort of learned how to talk to him about certain things, and he'll open up, and so I look forward to your coverage all year. But how do you think it will affect him as a guy stepping in for a manager of the year or a guy that's won, you know, manager of the year votes in, in two of his three seasons? Um, it's not it's not an easy thing for, for him to do. How do you think it will affect him having a short spring? Well, first, that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate that, and it's funny. Um, we did a, a live room chat for The Athletic for subscribers this morning, and I talked about how Ollie is just a naturally good communicator, and I think that's what's really going to give him an edge in a situation that I think you perfectly described. He's in no easy spot. I mean, he wasn't even in a normal 2022 season. Ollie Marmel wasn't going in with, you know, the most ideal situation. He has to answer to the obvious skepticism that he's already admitted is there from the fan base, as in from the front office perspective, how are you going to appoint the former manager's right-hand man and then cite philosophical differences in the organization? And, you know, then turn to someone who seems to share a lot of those beliefs, right? He has a lot to prove. He's a rookie manager, the youngest manager in the major leagues. And while he has had managerial experience in the minor leagues, I don't really know how to evaluate him at the major league level because we haven't seen him really manage games. I mean, we've seen him step in uh, during the 2021 season when Mike Schultz was ejected, but that wasn't very common. That was a pretty rare occurrence. So I think when it comes to Ollie, his communication skills are really going to have to take precedence, especially in the early season as he tries to corral a clubhouse that's going to be angry, right? You know, every single clubhouse in Major League Baseball is going to be angry and upset because already their season has been impacted. He's going to have to manage a bunch of things like managing injuries, managing playing time, how he's going to do that. We don't know because we have no idea when the season will start. And he's going to have to do so with a very heavy public eye of opinion on him because of the way the front office handled the Mike Schilt firing. So the thing that I'm confident in Ollie's abilities, the things that I'm confident in judging him and saying is his communication levels. You know, I, I have no idea how he's going to handle the lineup changes or the roster fluidity. We have ideas from what he's talked about, but we don't know for sure because we haven't seen it. But I have seen firsthand his communication skills, how much he stresses having a good, open, candid conversations and relationship with his players, and how he truly values that. He valued that as a bench coach. He valued that when he was working in the minor leagues. And I think that was part of the reason why the front office felt confident he could take over in the spot is because he's not afraid to have those difficult conversations. Uh, Katie, uh, based on the insights that you've gained talking to various people, how do you think, in what ways, I guess that's the best way to put it, in what ways would you envision that Ali Marmal will be more compatible with the front office? Because we know there was a rub there, a couple rubs maybe there that kind of blew up the Schilt mosaic relationship. In which, which ways will Ali Marmal be maybe more uh, more well suited uh, in that area that that will ensure uh, more harmony, more unity. You know what I'm asking. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's a fair question. I'm I'm not sure if there is a definitive answer to how that is going to unfold. Again, there's so much that we haven't seen that it kind of feels like the Cardinals hired Ollie. I don't know years ago at this point. But I think what we're really going to see early on is some roster flexibility and some lineup fluidity that we haven't really seen in years prior because the Cardinals haven't really had a lot of depth. I know that there was a time in, in um, late May, early June, Tyler O'Neill was hurt, Harrison Bader was hurt, Jack Flaherty had just went down. There weren't a little, uh, a lot of outfield um, possibilities, minus Dylan Carlson. There wasn't a lot of depth overall, and Mike Schultz was the one that had to answer those questions every day over a, a subpar performance for his ball club. I think Ollie immediately inherits better depth and better flexibility for his product. I mean, just look at the middle infield. You look at Paul DeYoung and Nando Sosa. Tommy Edmond, who I, I think is still severely underrated in the grand scheme of things, and, and the prospects, of course, of Nolan Gorman and Brendan Donovan. 
that's a lot of flexibility right there. Um, Lars Newbar brings some, some depth in the outfield. And I think that Ollie is, is so baseball-minded and has the ability to, again, communicate with these guys that he is going to be able to implement roster fluidity that we have not seen yet in, in prior seasons, especially under the Schilt era. And that's not a knock on Mike Schilt. That's more of a knock on how the team was constructed. So that's, I think, what if we were just going to debut – season was going to start and the roster was going to debut as is, I think we would be able to see a little bit more platoons. You'd be able to see the splits and the matchups better because for a first time in a long time, the Cardinals have the necessary depth to be able to do that. A couple more things for our friend Katie Wu, the athletic, by the way, please follow her on Twitter at Katie J Wu at Katie J Wu. And I want you all to uh, look, you might not be inclined to do it now because you're going to wait for, spring training to start or whatever, but please keep it in your mind to, you should subscribe to the athletic. They got some great, uh, great incentives now, you know, a great price for subscribing. I, I love it. I don't know what I could do without it. And that's not any way, shape or form a shot at other people who cover the team or cover sports, but it's, uh, it's essential to my reading list. It was when I worked at the athletic, I enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, Man, the timing was bad. You and I could have worked together a little bit. So that, that's oh, that too would have bad. Been so much fun. I think I about it all the time, Bernie. I really do. <laughs> I know. It would have been. It would have been. It really would have been enjoyable. But I wanted to ask you uh, one more baseball question and then one personal question. The personal question is nothing. Uh, you know, nothing too bad. It's actually like. No, of course. But, but, but uh, what do you think? Because you get this question all the time, and I know I know how you have handled the question, but. For, for our listeners who have not um, had the chance to read you or they're not they're going to get they're going to get a chance to read you but they haven't done so yet by subscribing to the athletic all right how, what, how do you uh, how do you see the the DH position being handled in 2022 okay you know what I I will be the first to say that I am very anti-universal DH even though I know the reasoning <laughs> and the logic is sound I get it I understand the argument I'm still going to be stubborn and say I don't like it Um but I do think that it provides the Cardinals with a unique opportunity, like I was talking about with their depth options, to play a committee of roles. I do not think the Cardinals are going to go out and shop for a Kyle Schwarber-esque kind of player or, or get the, the definitive DH role, that's it, that kind of guy. I really think they're going to rely, at least in the first part of the season, on their internal options because they have a lot of unproven depth and they need to see what of, who of those options is actually going to come to fruition where is each guy's ceilings? Who can they depend on for what? Um, that's especially true in Juan Yepes. They, they, again, they think very highly of Yepes, who's coming off a breakout season in the minors. Lars Newbar is certainly serviceable. Um, and, of course, Nolan Gorman, who, yes, made the transition from third base to second base and has done that really well. He's, he's been commended throughout the organization. But he's always been valued as more of a bench bat. So I don't see the Cardinals going out and shopping for someone that's going to block some of these young and up-and-coming talents. Um, I don't see the Cardinals going out and spending money on a, a bat that's going to essentially block their top prospect, right? Um, I do think that they are going to rely on a more of a committee approach. And when you think about it that way, that makes sense because you will have Paul DeYoung, you will have Edmundo Sosa. You could potentially give Tyler O'Neill a day off or Dylan Carlson a day off from defense, but keep their bat in the lineup. With Paul Goldschmidt, you can do that. You can do that with Nolan Arenado. Like, there is flexibility there, again, that we haven't seen for this Cardinals team in a long time. So I think at least to open up the season the first couple months, just so the front office can get a feel of what, what they have and what their options can bring, I think the Cardinals will go DH by committee. Finally, uh, a two-part question. Um, how have you enjoyed St. Louis so far? And I know it's been really hectic, so it's not – you're not – you wouldn't be as well-versed or I wouldn't expect you to be, you know, so far. You know, a year from now you'll know – you know, there'll be you'll be much more well-versed in everything St. Louis. But – Number one, how do you like it so far? But maybe more importantly, no offense to you, how has your cat transitioned to St. Louis? <laughs> That's actually <laughs> funny because I just had to swat her away because she was literally chewing on my foot in the middle of the DH question, and it was it was it literally hurt. I was like, this is not good. Well, see, um, she must she must be pro DH then. Yeah, she probably didn't like my opinion there. That she didn't sad. like your answer. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, St. Louis, minus the fact um, of the winter elements, that was new for me. And I'm not exactly a snow person, I've decided. Uh, I, I've really liked it. I mean, I just had my first St. Louis Mardi Gras, and, and that was certainly an experience. Um, I, what I, I just have been struck by is growing up in the Bay Area and, and growing up going to Giants and A's games. There's obviously, I think the Bay Area is a great sports market to, to grow up and live in. 
But when I came to St. Louis, I just really – and you can, you can tell people all the time, oh, it's a great baseball town. Oh, it's the perfect baseball market. I don't think you can really take it all in until you spend significant time there. I just absolutely am in love with how the city of St. Louis embraces baseball. I think it's a perfect place for people like you and me, Bernie, who live and breathe the sport, um, who share so much passion along with the fan base to, to try to cover the sport as effectively as possible. Um, all around, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've even adjusted to the humidity, although my hair has not. If you've ever seen me around the ballpark, you know not always a great hair day for me um but <laughs> all in all i you know i've I really enjoyed the the transition to st louis and hopefully soon we'll be spending more time at bush stadium um, but until then i guess i'll just continue exploring I've, I've done pretty good so far and finding little areas and and restaurants i enjoy so at least i guess if i have to pick a positive side i'll have a little bit more time to do that absolutely well it's it's great having you here and it was really great to have you on the show thanks for your generosity there and and we'll you know i'll try not to bug you too often but every now and then we got to check in and and just chat and uh, if there's anything we can do for you here you just let us know but it's a delight to have you on and uh keep up the terrific work uh at the athletic i, I noticed you did a live room today which is basically a live chat is that the best way to describe it i, I haven't had the time to go through it yet but i will later um, but that it looked like it was a lot of fun. It looked like you enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, it was like a live chat. It's a pretty new feature. Um, so I, I was not sure how it was going to go, but Cardinals fans, they always deliver. They, uh, if I'm going to try something new, they're always going to show up. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you, Bernie, asking me on. You know, you're never going to bug me. So okay, it's, it's cool. always nice to talk baseball with you. Oh, that's so nice of you. Well, Katie, until the next time, uh, take care and uh, try to keep busy somehow, right? Or, or catch I'll up on r- reading books or, 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 you know, you got to binge, you do some binge watching or whatever, you know, just have some fun while you, you have the downtime because then it'll I be mania. All right. Yeah. Take care. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rudy. That's our friend Katie Wu from The Athletic. She was great, wasn't she? I mean, I knew she would be. She was absolutely fantastic. And uh, another reason for you subscribe to The Athletic, if you like what you heard there, just the way her, t- her takes on various Cardinals things. But also wanted to get out the fact she's doing some fun things uh, within the realm of her her baseball beat at uh, the athletic and uh, having mailbags uh, that are, you know, cover a lot of ground, but also her, her the first live room chat today, which I look forward to reading later tonight. So that was cool. I enjoyed that. Um, she only made one mistake saying, oh, I'll come on and, you know, visit with you anytime. So it's the only mistake she made, but we'll, we'll still try not to not <laughs> overdo that, you know. <laughs> But she's wasn't she great? Yes, Seriously, she is very good. And I, you know what, Bernie, I felt for her when she first started because early in the baseball season, back in April, and you and I would, as soon as the lineup would come out, we'd be like, oh boy, here it is, and she would get the backlash of why is Carpenter in the lineup? Why? And she'd be like, calm down, I don't make the lineup. It's like I'll discuss it with you, but it, <laughs> I did not make the lineup. So, right. you know, that, congratulations to her on getting through the first year, and I know she'll do fine moving forward. But that's part of becoming the beat writer with the Cardinals, right? Yeah, she. Uh, you know, this is uh, look. This is one of those inside baseball things, uh, and people may or may not care. But you know, and she she actually wrote a story about this not that long ago that was really good. I kind of knew the basics, but. She was um, she was offered that job, uh, to the Cardinals beat. She she was just offered it out of nowhere, suddenly and unexpectedly. And it, it was, and now I'm I'm embellishing this, but not trying to embellish it. But it was almost like reading this story. It was just like, uh, well, we want you to have the Cardinals beat and like to offer it to you. Oh, oh wow, really? Yeah, yeah. We think you'll do a great job. Wow, and and. Um, you know, it was sort of like, okay, well, when you know, when do you think? Um, when when am I starting? What's the starting date? Uh, two days, you know, or something. <laughs> now, now I'm exaggerating for effect, but it was it was actually very much kind of like that, except they gave her a little more time uh, to to take the job and get into place. But she was just scrambling like mad to to. Uh, get acclimated and because this thing just happened she had to she had to move she had to move her stuff i mean her life's turned upside down for for a good reason it's a hell of a beat to have um but all of a sudden it's it's kind of like she's dropped into a baseball season she doesn't know anybody it's uh the pandemic rules are are still in effect in terms of access to players and coaches and management and everything 
and she's fortunate that the other people on the beat are good people and people, you know, were very happy to help her out as much as they could. And so that helped get her through it. And, but she, uh, man, it is, uh, it, it just couldn't have been, it couldn't have been, what's the word, as, as excited as she was to take the beat and have, have this wonderful opportunity, it just couldn't have been easy. You know, you're young, you've, you've lived your life in one area, your family's there, your friends are there, all of a sudden you're, you know, you're dropped into a baseball season, you're in St. Louis, you know absolutely no one, and you have to get up to speed uh, professionally, and you have to get up to speed personally to, to kind of resituate your life. I mean, it was really, really tough. And I thought that as the season went on, she got better and better and better and better and better, you know, and I became a, a, a really big fan. And look, I, I know she wouldn't be offended by me saying this. You know, at first I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I just wasn't, you know, and I, I knew it was tough for her to get, you know, assimilated as quickly as she would have liked. And I just wasn't sure. I was like, okay. You know, you always think of any writer uh, in any background, any situation. It's like, okay, show me what you got. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm wanting to be impressed. I'm rooting for her, but I'm like, all right, you know, show me, show us what you got. You know, because at some point, I, I think one writer can can see this, where maybe just people who aren't in the media don't really see it. There comes a point. It's like where you know someone's all right. They they've crossed that bridge. They're they're good to go now. And and I can't remember when that was, but there was a point in time last season when I was wondering how she would be, how she would do, um, wh- how long it would take. There was a point where she crossed that bridge, and I'm like, okay, now she's rolling, you know. So, mm-hmm. and I'm glad she's in our town. I hope she stays here for a while. 